We are men. Three things are obvious if you are men. Number one, we can also be called husbands. If you are a man, according to the definition of creme, that is, you are not a man until you are married. Therefore, the, the men who are over there, who may be older than some of us, are boys, <laughs> according to the definition of yeah. creme. So the first thing we need to understand is we are husbands. Number two, which is important for us to know, we are heads of the family. We may be related, but not exactly the same. Number three, which is very important, we are the priests of the family. We are the leaders of the, of the family. And that would be something that we need to understand. Number four, we are fathers of the family. That means they are ch children, whether biological or adopted. There will be children whom you can see if you, if you, the truth of the matter is you can't work on children. You can only pray. Mm. Uh, who, who talked about working? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> None of us ever worked. Mm. So let's not cheat you. We didn't work. Mm. Don't congratulate us for working hard. <laughs> we did not work. It's just a gift from God. And that's the scriptures. So don't bother working. Just hang loose. <laughs> and when you get children, we will not congratulate you. We know you did nothing. <laughs> these, these are important things to know. But one of the things that you are is that you are a, a father. Okay? And that's very important, very, very important to understand. The next thing, thing you are is you are a son-in-law. Uh, that's you who you are, a son. Mm -hmm. you know, that means you have parents that are not your biological parents, and yet they are parents. And that's a very important thing to understand. But the next one is you are a son. You are a son. No, you are not only a parent of a son, you also are a son. And uh, when we talk about the men fellowship, every one of those topics has to be dealt with because they are different and they the challenge in different, in different ways, and uh, and it will be important. Anyway, the time we have available, we don't have enough time to handle it. But I, I want to start with the first one. What is the, you are taking notes? What is the first one? Husband. Husband. I want to read for you, um, uh, the book of John, chapter four, verse seventeen. There's a lady here. And she is told, she says, I have no husband. She replied, Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. Why? They had a come we stay. Is that what we call it in Kenya? Mm -hmm. They come we stay. And she would stay with one husband and dump him and get to another. another. I don't, like I'm telling you, I don't have enough time. It's a full topic to discuss. But the first thing I want to ask you, are you in a come we stay? It's not scriptural. It is evil. Mm. Because the word of God is clear. Anybody who sleeps a woman they have not married are committing adultery. It's called immorality. And it's very interesting that if you sleep with a girl on the wedding day morning, you are going to hell. If you wait until the pastor says you are now married, do it a few minutes later, not, not immediate. Otherwise, you will see. But uh, <laughs> you are going to heaven. What has changed? <laughs> Simply the word wedding. Can you see how critical the wedding is? Now, so if you are in a calm, we stay. It means you can wake up one morning and tell your wife, you know, I've never even married you. Mm. And that's what happens with some, some women. They reach a level when they give, get a better man. They tell the pastor, you know this guy, I never even married. married him. So you need to lock yourself up by signing on the dotted line. Organize a wedding don't bother giving us tea because you're already together. We don't want tea. On a normal Saturday service, this is a pastor next to you. On a normal Saturday service, without any tea, the same way he normally dedicates children, he will just do a wedding in the middle of the service. So therefore, you don't have to send any cards. But now there are witnesses that you are getting married and you have started on the dotted line. Next time you start saying, but I'm not married, she has a specific to say. It is wrong to be in a relationship called marriage 
without locking yourself up. And it is a very serious issue because the moment you have marriage certificate, if you die, if the relatives want to take your things, you produce a certificate. Are we together? Mm -hmm. And that's why some men don't want. Say, Brother Nanga, but you know, me, I, I married, I got, we started staying together before I was a Christian. That's okay. What have you done since you became a Christian? A Christian. And remember, it does not involve money. Pastor, am I right? Yes. It doesn't involve money. At least I have participated in several weddings where I'm attending a Sunday service. And the pastor tells me, today we'll have a wedding. One, one of them, I was in an AIC church. I, we did the wedding. My work, of course, I'm not ordained, so I can't, I can't do the certificate. Yes. I am the one who preached on the, on the issues of marriage. The pastor did it. We finished. And then the bride and the groom, they didn't have any clothes. Mm. We were going home, and I saw them walking. I said, hey, let me at least drive you home. <laughs> so I'm the one who drove them to their house after their wedding. Now, I hope you are getting what I'm trying to bring out. That that is a matter we have to deal with. To have people, and the other day I heard of a church where they, somebody wanted to be the head of the women's fellowship. And they were asked, when did you get wedded? I, I'm not sure. Now, if you're not sure, how can you be leading the people in the church? And the word of God is clear in both Titus and Timothy. That if you haven't sorted out your matters at home, you don't qualify to be an elder. Have you read that one? Yes. So I'm talking to people here. If you don't have a marriage certificate, it is critical that you sort that matter out. Because the devil could use it to destroy your home. When your wife, you think you're the only one. Your wife will see a better man. And then say, but we are never married. The Satan is using something you have allowed in your own relationship. Remember, getting wedded does not mean you go to heaven more central than one who are not wedded. But not wedding will certainly create darkness in your relationship. Am I clear? Yes. And during question time, you can pin me down, pin down on it. This woman <laughs> was not clear whether she's married or not. And that's something you need to understand. The wedding is not a joke. In fact, the other day, I led somebody to the Lord. Well, the other day, she told me, Hey, Brother Nanga, praise the Lord, I'm married. I said, why didn't you invite me for the wedding? She asked me, did I have to? I thought, there's something wrong with me now. In fact, I started telling, you mean when I did follow up, I never told you about the importance of her? Wedding. No, we I mean, did not just marry. I went to the father's place and I talked with him and they told me it's okay, I can marry the daughter. So he went home to my house. My friend. You know, some things I assume are obvious. You know, this because it's common sense. But how many of you know that common sense is not common? Am I communicating? And that's why I thought in this meeting today, let us talk common sense. In case it is not common. common. And that's something that we need to sort out. The only thing I'm asking my pastor friends here to do, we must remove these wedding parties. It cannot be, we should not mistake the tea party for the wedding. That is not part of it. You can even we do a wedding today and give us the tea three years later. Because it's just a celebration, isn't it? So it's not part of the wedding. But please, within the next few months, sort out that matter. Don't be like this woman. Jesus met at the well. You know the woman you're talking about? You must sort out that matter. And I'm measuring my time. Nine minutes have gone. <laughs> now, First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. I'm still on husbands. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Again, which I had enough time to talk, but you are still on the husband. One responsibility you cannot delegate is satisfying your wife sexually. It cannot be delegated. Are we together? <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to understand if you call yourself a Christian and your wife is complaining about the issues of sex, you have an irresponsibility somewhere. Are we together? Yes. You are always tired. Huh? There's something wrong with your work. If every night you are tired. So it's important to understand that even if you are so professional, you are getting promotion continuously. 
you are getting you are getting promoted in an area you can easily be replaced. Mm. And failing in one where you cannot uh, be replaced. Yes. Am I communicating? <laughs> so it's very important to understand. And if you want to do well there, you have to agree to be a student. Uh -huh. You have to read about it. You have to discuss it with your wife. Because you don't know and she doesn't know. But you now become a teacher to one, one, another. one another. And please understand, First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, is saying, and I, I wish I had enough time to do this, is saying that you cannot refuse to have sex except on three conditions. Number one, the matter is discussed by both of you. Mm. One party cannot decide not to have sex. It has to be something discussed. And go and read it there. Don't quote me. Quote the, go to the scriptures. We are, we, are, we are talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 and 5. Number two, it must be only for a short time. Mm. Even if you, you are so spiritual, you want to stay for the next three years without sex. Now, the Bible says don't do that. It must be only for a short time. period. So it must be agreed. It must be a short period. And it must be for an important reason. Those are three pre re give reasons given for a period of no sex. It must be like for in that one, they claim there may be prayer and fasting or something. There's something you're actually doing. There has to be something big. And anyway, if I go on like that, my minutes 10 have gone, and I have, I'm only on, the on, the, on the first issue. What was the second one? The second role of a man. He has a what? A family head. And I now, now won't go, we won't go deep in that. It's a scriptural thing. We are in Ephesians chapter 5. It's the work of a husband to lead the family. But let me quickly say what it is not. To be a leader of your family is not to be the dictator of the family. A dictator is the one who says, let's go east. Uh, yes, that's why. I said it. Now, if you're that kind of a man, you're not a scriptural husband. The head of a family is like a chairman. And the chairman of a meeting only announces what the meeting has. Say. So the debate is done, debate is done. Finally, when you're announcing, it's the chairman who? And the chairman could easily be announcing something he was opposed to. But the committee, after discussing, agreed on it. You, you people are in committees, am I right? Does that happen? Yeah, where you are now something, but the truth is you didn't agree with it. It's only you realize the majority, the majority direction. And since you are the chairman, you must announce. So when you talk about leadership as a leader in the family, it must be something discussed, but announced by the, by, 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 announced by the chairman. You are only a chairman, not a, not a dictator. Number two, when you say you are a leader of the family, it means you're a consultant. Because how do you get information? There are things that you need to understand your, husband, your wife knows better than you. For example, I know very well that if I'm negotiating for something, my wife can negotiate until cows come home. <laughs> Me, I normally give up very quickly. So if I want good money for our family, if our family money I want to save, I wouldn't go to negotiate for land without her. Because I know she will push the guy until he is half the price. <laughs> Me, if he only drops 1%, oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's sign. No, you need to understand the gifting God gave you in your wife. Are we together? Yeah. And I don't know what you are this. Check and ensure that although you are the announcer on such places where you know you are not as gifted, because there's no reason God gave you that woman except that he knew your weakness. So don't pretend not to have a weakness. Otherwise, you don't need a wife. Are we together? Mm -hmm. You need to understand as a leader of the family. And that will be, again, I'm taking too long for, on one issue. What was the third one? Priest. Now, when you say you are a priest, what we are saying is God holds you responsible if your family goes to hell. What the work of a priest? The work of a priest is to listen to God so that he can tell the congregation, who are, who, the wife and the children, what God is saying. And at the same time, it's the work of the priest to listen to the sins and the failures of his congregation and report them to God for forgiveness. Are we together? That's what you have to do. 
So one of the most important things you have as a man is to ensure that by the time you die, or by the time they die, whoever dies earlier, they are dying to go to heaven. And you die leaving them committed to God. So do not say, oh, but I bought them a car. Oh, I took them to Masai Mara. Those things are good. But they are not as important as the eternal destiny of your family. So you need to understand. That's why you can't come to a conference like this without your wife. Because you want her to hear, isn't it? You know, a lot of men do that. You go for missions, for missions, for missions. Within no time, you are spiritually in the, a place where your wife doesn't understand you. Because you are going alone. So it's very important to understand. That's why it's the responsibility of the family to ensure they buy a daily guide or a daily power to ensure that the children grow studying the scriptures. Are we together? It's you to ensure every January, like now it's, it's this month, December, you go to a bookshop and buy a devotional guide so that you don't read the Bible like a witch doctor's book. You know a witch doctor's book? A witch doctor, you close it, then you think, the witch doctor thinks, what, where do I, wherever it opens. That's where you read that day. <laughs> then your children learn that the Bible is a witch doctor's book. Mm. Yet the Bible was written, chapter 2 was written after chapter 1. So you can't jump like that and help your children to know God. It must be systematic. When you read chapter 1, go to chapter 2, go to chapter 3, and you must talk at the level of the children. That's why the, as a priest of the family, you have one time alone with God. That's why everybody has three, three, three um, quiet times. Three quiet times. Number one, you must stay praying. between you. Nobody else is involved. You and God. On a daily basis. There's something you are reading, like for, my, for me and Rebecca, every evening we study together. That's a family one. Every morning, I wake up and go to a different room. She goes to a different room. We are reading different places. Like, I'm not reading now. You had that today, say she is currently reading now. Mm. Me, I'm not there. I'm actually in the book of Thessalonians. We share, but we are learning, because you need to hear God. And you are praying. And remember, part of the prayer is the problem she gave you last night. How do you pray with her listening? And you are reporting her to God. Am I communicating? <laughs> <laughs> so it's important that you have one-on-one -on -one with God. Daily. Then in addition to that, you have now one with her. A family that prays together stays together. Then the third one is one with the children. And the one with the children, the one I was saying, must be brought to the level of the children. Are we together? So you cannot, you cannot claim to have had a quiet time by having a family altar. The family altar is not meant for you. It is meant for the children. So you must lower it. Like now, when my children were young, we couldn't use a daily guide. I used to buy a Bible in the pictures before they went to school. A Bible in the pictures where they look at it, they see Moses looking like, then I tell the story of Moses. Then it is a level where there is another book called God and Me, which is for people who know how to read. Then you go to daily power, which is now for high school people. Then now go to daily guide. You must bring your children meeting at the level of their age. Are we together? And always at the level of the youngest. Because the youngest understand, even the old ones will understand. Anyway, I've run out of time for that, but you can see it's a very important subject on its own. What was the next one? Father of the family. Now, that, that's uh, three things. Number one, and by the way, you can find this message in my YouTube account. If you go to YouTube, Google John N. N. Nganga, John N. N. Nganga YouTube account, you will find I've talked about fatherhood and a husband, and all, all of this, you can find the talks, the talks there. But um, you, are a, you are a father means you are a parent. Are we together? Yeah. Three things about them. Number one, to understand you are not the owner of the child. You are only a, a steward of the child. The child belongs to God and will never belong to you. So it will be very important to understand that, that even if the child cannot talk for themselves, the owner of the child, who is God, will hold you accountable for how you treated with him. I keep telling women that I like the name they give to the room where children are born. Do you know what the room is called? What do you call the room where the children are born? That labor ward. The, within the labor ward, there's a place called delivery room. 
Am I right? Yeah. And I say the reason it's called a delivery womb is to remind the woman that the child doesn't belong to her. To, to her, is only delivered. God used the delivery system. The child belongs to God. So as a parent, you have to keep reminding yourself that that you are not the owner of the child at any time. Number two, that children are not part of your marriage. As a father, please keep remembering, you are trying to train the child to serve God in their time. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. And David, after he had served God's purpose, it's very important to understand you are helping the child. Your work is like a training college to help the child so that you will serve God in the, in the, in the nation or wherever God will send them. But they are not part of your... Children are not part of your marriage. You know something? If you marry at 25 and die at 85, how long will be your marriage? 60, 60 years. Now, in those 60 years, only 20 or less will the children be with you. Do you agree with me? <laughs> at the age of 18, they go to university and disappear for good. So it's very important to understand you have been married for 60 years. 40. There were no children. You begin without children. And for most of your time, you have no children. If you came to our house, you will not know whether at any time you have had any children. <laughs> Except Cosmos has come once when the, when the grandchildren are there. So it's, 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 it's very important. So there is something very wrong with the fathers. They treat the children like they belong to them. They even start ignoring their husband's duties. In fact, they start, calling the, they start calling their wife the mother of my children. Because she's not a wife. She is the mother of our <laughs> children. Now, you need to understand that as a parent, it's a temporary activity. After some time, the only thing you do as a parent is prayer, because that will never graduate from. You must pray for them, but you can't. It's very... Number three, which is important as a, as a parent, is to understand the biggest deliverable of parenting is under the child understanding God. Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's the responsibility of the parent not Sunday school to help the child to understand who God is. Wow, 22 minutes are gone. Now, what's the, what's the next one? Son-in-law. Huh? Son-in-law. Son-in-law. What that means is that you have in-law issues. In-law issues is how do you relate with, your, with the parents of your wife? And so when you say we're having in-law problems, basically it just means you haven't learned how to deal with them. Three things. Number one, the way to love someone is to love who they love. So it means that if you want trouble in your marriage, treat the parents of your, of your wife carelessly. And sometimes you not talk at all. But I can tell you, they stayed together, they were brought up by this woman. If you embarrass, their mother, there will be trouble in your own bedroom. Do you agree with me? And you are the cause. So as a son-in-law, for the sake of peace in your own home, treat their mother better than your mother. <laughs> Am I communicating? Because your own mother, you have no difficulty. Am I right? <laughs> so the standard of how to treat your mother-in-law is better than your mother. And you will reap the dividends, including the bedroom. All because of the way you treated the mother. And that's one of the things that will be very important. Number two, please understand that treating them well does not mean obeying them. Adults are not expected to obey adults. The word of God is absolutely clear. Honor your father and mother. It doesn't say obey them. In Ephesians, it talks about children. Children obey parents. So when you are children, you must obey. When you become an adult, the only thing required out of you is honor. So it's very important to understand that at times, they will tell you to do something, but you can't do it. But because the scriptures are saying honor them, the way you say no will be so sweet, you don't even understand you have said no. My recommendation is, whenever you have to say something hard, Use the mouth of your wife. Are we together? Mm -hmm. It's the responsibility of your wife to tell their mother no. 
not you. You just smile and smile and smile. Then she goes behind you and says, by the way, he, what he meant is, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because if, there, if, the wife, if, you are, if your wife annoys them, she'll be forgiven very easily. When you annoy them, they may remember for the rest of their life. Am I right? Because yeah. somehow, you know, they know their daughter. They had her in nappies. There's something, and sometimes, you know, there are new words people are using. No, this is not my, this is not my mother-in-law. This is my mother in love. Have you heard that statement? Yeah. Total nonsense. Yeah. Because the truth is, you, she, she met you as an adult, isn't it? She does not know you as a baby. So she will very easily get annoyed. On, and if the wife, the daughter did the same thing, she does not seem annoyed. And you need to understand with her, she's a human being. So she still remains a mother in law. In law does not mean somebody hated. It means somebody you are careful with. Am I communicating? I don't know what, what Maluki would say, whether, it, <laughs> whether it's illegal, illegal or not. But the, basically, what, that's what you, anyway, I have to stop, I have to stop that. But have I communicated? Yes. That, that's an area you must handle well, very, very clearly well. Now, what's the next one? You are a son. And the, now you can understand, I've already introduced the subject. Your own parents, you certainly must show them respect, but not obedience. If the parents are asking you to do something that is not right, and you say yes, how do you know there is no, the, the reason they are telling you to do that is because they are saying now? You know, say now? Mm. You know, it doesn't announce. It doesn't announce when it's coming. So your parents may be telling you something to do. They mean it, but it's because their mind is not the way it used to be. Are you really doing them a favor by agreeing to do something that will embarrass them? No. no. The way to honor your parents is to find a nice way of saying no because of reasons. Mm. Are we together? And that's very important. Let me then say the second thing and finish. Please understand that blessings do not come from parents. You cannot bless your child, neither can your father bless you. Blessing, just go to the ironic prayers. And those of you who are pastors, you know, the ironic blessing. You know the ironic one? The way Aaron was, it is written in the scriptures, the way Aaron blessed the children of Israel. He did not say he had any blessings. He prayed for God to bless. What's called ironic blessing is a prayer by Aaron for the children of Israel. So when we talk about parents blessing their children, we mean parents praying for their children. Because no parent has a source of blessing. Blessing is spiritual. So you, how can you give something spiritual and you are a human being? Am I communicating? So when I say I'm blessing my daughter, what I mean is I'm praying for blessings. Now, once you understand that concept, you then know that even if your mother cast you, because cast like blessing is spiritual, it means she is praying for trouble for you. Will the Lord hear that prayer? Yes. <laughs> yes? Will the Lord hear that prayer? Tell me. You have served the Lord, said no to your mother, because your mother is asking you to do something evil. And you have said no. And then she is praying you should be cast because you have disobeyed her. No, God can't do it. be clear. <laughs> By the way, Numbers tells, tells us about it. Balaam and Barak, isn't it? God bless the Israelites. The prophet wants to cast them. And he finally had to tell the king, hey, how can I bless that which God has? How can I cast that which the Lord has? It means your parents are wasting their time casting you. You are not casable. Am I communicating? Mm. If you want blessings, stay in God. Do not live in sin. Respect your parents. My friend, if you dishonor your parents, you will have a proper curse. And it will not be from your parents. It's from God. Because God is the one who said, honor your father and mother. Because it's a commandment with a promise. promise. So if you don't honor them, you get a curse. Even if your parents bless you, and you're already cursed by God, does it help? No. So it's very important to understand in your relationship as a son, you must honor them, but at the same time, do not obey them in order to dishonor God. What was the next one? Sorry? You are finished. You are finished? Yeah. 
Oh, that's good, because that the minutes are gone. I'm, I'm timing myself. Okay, the first question. It may be out of what I've said, or when you came, you intended...